Some like it hot, hot, hot. We sure yes, do. do. Hey, the S&P 500 <laughs> is coming off of its third consecutive day of closing at an all-time high. That's right. And the Dow Jones also set its record at Monday's close. And the historic gains are being driven by just a handful of massive tech stocks. The so-called Magnificent Seven make up nearly 30% of the S&P's market value. And gains from just those companies, which include Microsoft and Apple, have accounted for more than 60% of returns over the last 12 months. Joe Renison joins us back here in Studio 57. He's a financial markets reporter for The New York Times, where he covered this in his recent article. Uh, you co-authored that. Uh, mm -hmm. It was very interesting to read it. So talk to us, Joe, about why these companies have been doing so well, just really on fire over the last couple of years. Yeah, uh, absolutely. So there's a few reasons. There's a sort of... Uh, a collection of companies in there that are definitely driven by different things. Tesla's in there, that's an mm -hmm. auto company, it's an electric car maker. Google's in there, uh, it's predominantly an ad company. So are Microsoft and NVIDIA, predominantly beneficiaries of the boom in AI over the past year. And that's really been the big unexpected uh, one that's kind of come out um, and really driven a lot of these stocks markedly higher. But the important thing to note about this is it's not just the size of the stock moves themselves. It's because those stock moves are happening at very large companies already. Right. And the way the S&P 500 and certainly other indexes uh, work as well is they give a greater weighting, a greater influence, if you like, to the bigger companies. And that makes sense because when their stock price moves up and down, which is essentially a reflection of the value of that company, you're creating vast amounts of value and you're destroying vast amounts of value, mm. even from fairly small percentage moves up and down. Whereas if you have a much smaller company, something like Carnival Cruise Lines, which was up, I think, about 100% last year, a huge move, it's a fraction of the size of Apple. It has a much more almost indistinguishable effect on the S&P 500 as a whole. It's interesting because you almost seem to be suggesting that in some ways they distort the overall picture. I mean, you've got seven companies essentially responsible for the health of the overall market. We've always had big companies that kind of do that in a way. But you write that the benefit can also be a loss, that they can swing both ways, especially if they're gaining on something like artificial intelligence, which we don't know where it goes from yeah. here. So what's the risk? Yeah, absolutely. Um, the risk, I think, as much as any, is in the perception of what we draw from markets. Mm. We see the S&P 500 at a new high. Uh, that seems like it's a good thing. That seems right. to be quite, you know, uh, not frivolous, but there's certainly a fervor underpinning that of kind of optimism and hope that the economy is going to remain strong. And yet, when you kind of peel back the onion or dig a little bit deeper, you see that the S&P wouldn't be at a new high if it wasn't for these seven stocks. It'd be about 8% off that, in fact, still. Interesting. There was a point last year where uh, we had the banking crisis in March. S&P 500 finished up 3% in the middle of a banking crisis. <laughs> yes, actually, I wanted to ask you about that because uh, in your article, you said that the banking crisis really didn't damage uh, the, the market. It all be, no. quote, largely because of the fur surrounding advances in artificial intelligence. It's, yeah. It was very interesting that, that this new innovation that is in some ways untested, it's not sure how it's going to right. ultimately affect these companies, society, et cetera, that, that, that at the same time that we're having this banking crisis, our stock market's just continuing to rise. Like that's, that sort of boggles it, expectations. Right. And, it, and it, uh, you use the word distorts. I'm wary of using the word distorts because it's showing you the right thing it's showing you creation and destruction of value within the market. But it sends a signal that we think, oh, well, everything's fine, everything's good. Yet maybe that's not the signal we should actually be taking at all times. Things are pretty good right now. People are pretty optimistic about the economy. The rally has broadened. The Magnificent Seven's actually been a lot more mixed this year, this month, than it was last year. But last year, the market was telling us something different. It was, it was telling us that there is an immense amount of hope and opportunity around a small number of stocks, and that other than that, there's quite a lot of caution mm -hmm. out there. There was a manufacturing recession that we basically didn't really not notice in the market last year. Mm. And, you know, whilst some would say that's a, a cause for concern because so much of the market has been dependent on such a small number of companies, others would say, well, it actually creates this opportunity that if the Magnificent Seven start to slip a little bit, there's a lot of stocks out there that have been in the doldrums 
that maybe are ready to kind of take over the leadership a little bit. Yeah, um, I encourage people year. to read your article at the New York Times because it helps yeah. really the explain. The graphic especially, so good. Great graphics that. and it graphics. explains everything beyond, great, yeah. beyond the headline. Joe Renison, thanks for being with us today. Appreciate it. Thank you.